Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Glenn Jones, CEO of Icebreaker Finance. Icebreaker Finance is a new DeFi application that allows miners to take out loans on chain. In today's episode, we talk about the mining credit crunch, what makes a good borrower, and if ASIC-backed loans will survive as a collateral type. The future of digital asset mining calls for top technical talent. Enhance your ASIC education with Foundry's hands-on courses. Led by veteran industry instructors, Foundry's three-day mining intensive and five-day mining technician academy programs cover a range of topics from identifying issues and troubleshooting common hardware failures to coursework covering Bitcoin's global impact. Open to enthusiasts and professionals alike, visit www.foundryacademy.com to learn more and sign up for the course that's right for you. Glenn, welcome to the show. I'm Thankful for you being here during this credit crisis or credit crunch. I don't know exactly what to call it, but there's certainly a lot of turmoil in crypto markets. And so we'll get a little bit of perspective from you to start off the show. And then really what we need to dig into later is the MiFi sector and what it looks like now after all this carnage has come out. But again, welcome to the show. Thank you, Will. It's a pleasure to be here. I've been an avid listener since I've been a student of the industry. So really happy to support you and, and others. Yeah, again, thank you for joining. We'd start off with Icebreaker Finance. You guys made some headlines, I think it was two or three months ago now, where Icebreaker Finance worked with Maple Finance, which is a lender of sorts. I'm going to allow you to explain it to, to listeners since you're going to be better than that than I am. Uh, but you guys made some headlines that you were moving to the MiFi sector right when all these mining firms were showing signs of holding distressed assets and interest payments that they're not able to make. So you guys were sort of seen as like maybe the savior coming in the 11th hour. Uh, that was probably not a uh, fair way of positioning it, but I think that's how a lot of people interpreted it at the time. Now we're uh, having you on the show to show you, to talk about like what you guys are borrowing against or lending out to people. Um, but I hand it off to you. Let's talk about Icebreaker Finance maple finance and get a rundown on what those two are and how they interact together uh so we launched this business earlier this year and we really launched it with um with two thoughts in mind the first is that we are of the view within the team that private credit markets going on chain with complete transparency of where did the capital come from and where is the capital going to on what terms but with still all of the enforcement that is customary in any kind of commercial lend, all of the security perfection, real world assets, collateral, all of that kind of good stuff, we think that's a tremendous opportunity that we're really keen to be a part of. So we're a collection of commercial bankers, been in and around the game for a long time. I've spent more than 20 years in the industry, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere. And we formed Icebreaker really that we want to be part of what we think will be a real sea change in terms of how private credit markets work. And uh, if that's a sort of a macro uh, thesis, then within that to question came, but where do we want to start the journey? Well, for us, we wanted to start in the Bitcoin mining and digital asset infrastructure provider sector of borrowers that wanted to facilitate movement of capital from lenders to those borrowers and do it all on chain, where we can take security over real world assets. Do that on chain where at any time someone can go on and say, well, if capital came in again, Which borrowers did it go to at exactly what terms? And are they paying their loans? So we thought that'd be really, really powerful. And we wanted to start with that sector for a couple of reasons. And the first is that you don't need to explain to a Bitcoin miner or a digital asset infrastructure provider of what USDC is, what's a wallet. If we started with other sectors, we might have to have that conversation. So that makes it a, a great starting point. But the second, and also talks to the market timing, We had a little sneak preview of this industry through some personal contacts and networks at the end of last year, and we didn't think the pricing of risk was attractive at that time. When we made the decision to go all in, which was around May, and try and become really deep students of the industry, we did that on the basis that we thought the pricing for risk was about to change. We're already seeing that back in May. And that, as someone that wants to facilitate movement of capital, you really want to get compensated for taking risks. And we didn't feel those that uh, compensation was attractive last year. We thought it's going to become much more attractive. So that made it a really good time to enter. So that's a little bit about us. We're a small team. We're split between Australia and the United States. There's only six of us, um, all sort of bankers by trade. And we partner up with Maple Finance, 
So we looked around for, well, who can we partner with who shares some of those same aspirations? And frankly, I was blown away when I, uh, as a banker, when I first went on to Maple Finance and I could look at a pool and I could say, wow, I can see where every dollar's gone. I could hire my own engineer if I wanted to scrape that same information from the smart contract. That transparency inherent in DeFi, that just impressed the socks off me. And I looked at it and I thought, they're doing it with a bunch of crypto market makers, crypto um, native participants. They're doing it in an uncollateralized form or collateralized only with digital assets. Wonder if we can leverage that same infrastructure, that same platform that the Maple team have built to take it into other segments where we can take real world assets as collateral, still with the same transparency with all the enforceability that I'm accustomed to as a banker. Um, and I thought they had the great platform. So that's why we said, right, that's the team we want to partner with. And perhaps there are other uh, platforms out there uh, doing it just as well that I haven't come across. So no disrespect to them if that's the case. Um, but I was super impressed what um, Joe, Sid and their whole team have put together. And we wanted to be part of that. Explain to me a little bit more about the DeFi angle of this, because I do think a lot of Bitcoin miners, not necessarily Bitcoin maximalists, but oftentimes sort of come from that uh, crypto skeptic angle where they're only interested in Bitcoin and ASICs, and that's about it. So from a from your perspective, like what is the value proposition that a DeFi market brings to uh, ASIC financing or minor financing? Yeah, so why don't I think about it from two sides? The person that provides the capital, the party that provides the capital, and the party that receives the capital, namely the miner. The party that provides the capital, and perhaps many of your listeners would have been LPs in credit funds through the time. They sign on to the fund, they sign on to a fee, they place their capital into it, and uh, particularly if they're investing in private credit, they won't know how that fund is performing on a daily basis. Then at the end of a quarter, you might get a memo, gives you a, a little uh, uh, a chart telling them, here's how much of the capital has been deployed, which sectors it's been deployed to, uh, some interesting commentary around that, the overall thesis. So that's what you typically get as a lender. You might have lockup periods, all those other aspects to it. Well, in this model, what we can do with DeFi is it's not a wait for the quarter plus three weeks for where did the capital go? go. It's a login whenever you wish. It's on chain. This pool collected this amount of uh, USDC, I'll call that the capital. And here's exactly where every dollar has been deployed. To whom, at what rate, at what maturity, and are those cash flows being honored? Now, I think from a lender, someone who's providing capital in, the appalling experience that so many of us have felt over the past couple of months of what is the solvency, what is the liquidity position of the counterparties. And when so many people have found themselves effectively providing unsecured credit and they've perceived exchanges and they perceive some of these other CFIs as banks when clearly they are not. Um, but understandably, if you're perhaps not deeply literate in, um, in financial markets, that can be a mistake that's easy to be made. And that trend, what, what addresses that? Yes, regulation can help. But what can also address that is just transparency. And credit to many of the people on Twitter, you know, they're well out there here at the Wall Street Journal tracking wallets, trying to understand where, where capital is coming and who owes who what. Well, you get into the DeFi land, there's no question marks about that. Here's where the capital came in. Here's exactly where it's been deployed. So from that, from a lender point of view, someone providing capital, I think that's transformational for confidence. Really helps you understand what you're dealing with and you can make informed decisions. Um, now, the other aspect that, of course, is for, for borrowers. Why would borrowers want to look at this? Well, some might say from a borrower point of view, the transparency is not in their interests. There might be some, some private companies that say, I don't want it up in lights that I just borrowed X many, X many million USDC. And I respect that. This won't be the right platform for them. But I would suggest that for most borrowers, if you're a private company, you're an entrepreneur, you've successfully raised equity, you're building a great business and you want to get your first bit of debt financing in. If you're that entrepreneur and you're typically going to what we might call venture credit, you're going to high yield, you're going into the private markets, typically you've got a real information asymmetry. It's really hard to know who, whose door do I knock on and what's a good rate look like? Price discovery is super hard. And then you're going to find yourself typically up against a bunch of banker type people who are going to be accustomed to negotiating with people like you all day long and they're probably going to outdo you. Now, we get into the, the DeFi world, and I'm super excited about a situation where we can say, well, here's 12 credits. Capital's been provided to those 12 credits. 
Their names are all listed. Click the link, go to the website. They have been performing and they have delivered on their obligations and the terms in which they've delivered, completely transparent. So I can imagine from a borrower point of view where I might knock in their door now and we're speaking to many, many borrowers across the sector, negotiate some terms, agree some terms with them, put some debt down. I wouldn't be at all surprised come six or nine months for the team and I, one of our biggest challenges and the lenders putting into the pool, how do we retain these borrowers? Because what we've just done is create a billboard, big advert on the side of the highway. These are great borrowers in the industry and they've all been resurfacing their debt. What does every other banker on the street do? Fantastic. We've just given them a roller text on who to call because they can see the payment history. So I think what that does to borrowers, it expands the pool of capital available to them. It lowers their cost of capital. And that's a pretty out, great outcome for borrowers, which I think DeFi more broadly has the opportunity to facilitate. Um, and doing it over real world assets with all that sort of security and forcibility, it's a customary to commercial lend. Uh, I really think the next five, 10 years, we can make great headway, not just for Icebreaker and Maple, but more broadly across the industry. And we can talk about blockchain and crypto as a technology which makes existing use cases better. I love that rundown. Thanks for doing that. I want to ask one follow-up question before we talk about the, the current market structure, get your opinion on that. In terms of enforceability, we've seen a few of these minor financing deals go sour lately where you know, people have defaulted on them or decided that they can't pay them and they're looking back to their creditors to figure out what to do with them. For Maple Finance and Icebreaker Finance, how do you guys claw back collateral in the cases where someone was not able to pay? And I'm specifically meaning like real world assets because DeFi has the ability to liquidate loans automatically on chain, which is a pretty cool innovation. But for miners, obviously not able to liquidate an ASIC on chain. Yeah. So two parts of this. One is the enforceability aspect. And the next is how you sort of monetize the best value to, def to protect value for your lenders. First question is enforceability. You have to have a security agent. You have to have a set of loan documentations, totally legally enforceable, signed by all those parties. And those loan documentation, they're, they're long. Anyone who's done commercial lending, it's a big sort of 25-page document. Very, very clearly stipulates the terms, the counter, the parties involved in the transaction, stipulates the covenants, um, and all the procedures that you might go through in an event of soft or hard default. These things are very well understood in the commercial banking world. So when we go into DeFi, it's not a case of, well, let's surrender any of that enforceability. We're keeping it all. What we're doing is we're just memorializing a thin part of that big, thick document and putting it in the smart contract so that everybody can see where it's at. But the enforceability, I think, has been tested. We spent a lot of uh, time on legal counsel between Maple and ourselves, have complete confidence that, confidence that our security agent can enforce uh, in that situation should we have a default. Now, to your next question about, well, how do you monetize and protect value for lenders? That's a great question. Now, a lot of that comes down to, and will naturally be very bespoke to any given situation, a lot of it will come down to, well, what was the terms of your lend? We saw a bunch of loans go out last year, which were non-recourse financing into an SPV. And often that SPV was not an income generating, and forgive me for all of the, the um, vernacular here, but I'm a company, I can go set up a little company over there that's bankruptcy remote. That thing can die and it doesn't affect me. So I'll put an SPV in there. I can put a bunch of assets in there. In this example, last year what was common is you put a bunch of assets in there. Um, so I'll put those processes in there. I'll bring capital into that and I'll say to them, if, if that entity doesn't repay, you can take the kit. Now, that model is very common in vehicle fleet financing. I often make the joke, forklift financing. Applying that model to highly correlated assets where the probability of default, unfortunately, has a real correlation. When that probability of default goes up, the value of those assets goes down. So in the industry, we call that wrong way risk. If you're going to go and do a loan with lots of wrong way risk, that is a significant risk to be taking. And it's a very hard risk to manage. Now, that was a common format where the that went out last year, not universal, but common. And the compensation for taking that risk uh, was our view last year inappropriate um, and wasn't adequately compensating the allocators for putting taking that risk. So 
non-recourse financing to an entity which doesn't innately generate cash flows uh, in where we want to play on the risk curve in this pool, that's not something we'll be contemplating. But where we see that across the industry, uh, many financiers, I think, are in they're in a tough position now because we see some lenders, and we've seen this with publicly listed borrowers, rather, some publicly listed borrowers say, look, thanks very much, take the kit. Now, the financier on the other side of that, they look at the kit, and given that correlation, the kit's probably worth 10%, 20% of what it was originally. What are they going to do with it? There's warehouses full of the stuff. They're going to turn around to a hosting partner? Now, there are some conversations, unfortunately, where the financier might find themselves turning back to actually the person that just defaulted. And that person defaulted says, well, you could host it with us for 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Would you like to do that? And the financier, frankly, says, well, I've got no choice now. So uh, borrowers that are relatively sophisticated and willing to play a little bit of hardball there, because it comes with some reputational damage, can default in that scenario and actually... For their shareholders, that can be a great outcome. So I think it's really important to think about that format. What's appropriate for the level of risk being taken? Um, and that's just not the kind of format that we'd be contemplating. Um, and that was all part of our thesis of uh, um, if we went with a different format and we the kind of format we're taking to market now, if we turned up without at the end of last year, and frankly, when I had some early conversations at the end or beginning of this year, people would have just laughed at me. And they would have said, that's not where the market's at, Glenn, go away. Um, well, the market's moved, obviously. Um, those other lenders aren't knocking on their door or bashing their door down anymore. Um, so I think there's an opportunity to have a, uh, a more mature conversation about compensation for taking risk. Now, you've, you've described a few different players in the industry, and we won't name names, but you've described definitely a few players in the industry that have made some interesting choices the last year, and we're seeing it all sort of uh, play out in front of us right now. And I, I want to contextualize everything that we're talking about within that CFI, DeFi framework, because uh, as you so eloquently put it earlier, like you can see everything on chain if you put everything in a smart contract. And, and if it's enforceable in the real world as well, which I think is key to have both those parts together, then you do get a very robust contract. Uh, but looking at like the lay of the land right now, like we have reports at Genesis, uh, one of the most uh, important and oldest lending firms in crypto is seeking up to $1 billion. That's according to Wall Street Journal from about a week ago. Uh, there's some additional reporting on, on Twitter that's not verified that they might not be looking for that much money at this point, but we'll see, have to see uh, this week or over the coming weeks what's going to happen there. Nidig is another big name in the minor financing sector that has been taking custody of ASICs from various mining firms like Stronghold, Iris, etc. There's, you know, they had these SPVs or exactly what you described a second ago. You know, they just they had a loan out and it was backed by ASICs and now they've taken possession of those ASICs. But what are you going to do with um, 20,000, 40,000 plus ASICs at this point, especially with energy costs? Uh, so it's definitely tough. I'm going to throw this back to you. One question looking backwards first. What led to all these financing firms agreeing to these terms, which in hindsight, are egregious. Like, no one has a space to put 10,000 ASICs on a moment's notice. So what was going through people's minds when these were created? Was like up only, just spreading to the lending market as well? Look, it's a really good question. And um, I look back, so I've been in the game 20 years. Now I look back on it and I've made plenty of mistakes through that 20 years. Um, and one of the hardest things, and this is where I've got enormous sympathy for many of my colleagues, uh, the financiers across the industry, there was a, a quote from 2008 or 2009. It was the Citigroup CEO at the time. And for students of, um, of finance, I'm sure many will remember it. And it was something to the order of the music's still playing, so I've still got to dance. Um, I'll get that slightly wrong, but something of that ilk. So if you're a financier and you were working in one of those companies that we've just mentioned and others that were putting credit out the door, market was pricing at a certain level. So you had a choice. Stop participating in the market or... Put it out the door and try and best as you can with covenants and other non-financial measures to protect yourself. Or maybe do risk sub-participations where you put some of the risk out the door on the other side. And that's something we also don't hear much about. It wouldn't surprise me at all, and I won't mention names. Some of these uh, lenders you've referenced are pretty sophisticated people. I'd be surprised if they housed all of that risk on their balance sheet, if they didn't have some sub-participation sub notes on the other side 
with people buying some of that risk. I certainly hope they did and distribute, not just originate the risk, to distribute it as well. So I think for that sense, um, many across the industries, you look through cycles. Uh, it, it takes not only um, not only intellect, but it takes, I guess, um, some financial courage to say, I'll st- I'm going to walk off the pitch now. Um, that's really tough to do, I think, frankly, as an employee of an organisation. Now, if it's your own capital at risk, I think that focuses the mind. It's going back to sort of the merchant banking business of old, if we go back now sort of a, you know, 60, 70 years ago, um, when it's your own capital at risk, I, I think that might um, lead you to walk off the pitch a bit earlier than it would, frankly, if you're an employee in a, in a corporate. So coming to the table now for Icebreaker, um, which is the business that I founded, I think that's really focusing my mind when I go out there and look at the lens, as while I'm using third-party capital, uh, our business provides uh, an equity tranche first loss capital on the loans. So we need to write a performing book. Um, Now, that incentive structure really puts me very, very, um, and my family's capital right on the line. So uh, I think that can engender some better decision-making. And I'm not sure that if I had been sitting in one of those other institutions you've mentioned, would I have had the courage to say, this isn't good pricing, I'm out? and basically have to resign, I'm not sure I would have had that courage. Um, so I've got a lot of empathy for that position that the finances are in. Uh, but let's hope that some of them have syndicated some of that risk and they're not all housing it. What do you think happens with some of these lending firms over the next three, six months? Do you think that the worst is behind us? I'm seeing a, f- a few people sort of shout that out. And I, I really like the optimism there. And I'm actually sort of agreeing with it at this point. So look, I don't have any real market intel on what the state of those balance sheets are in. Um, uh, you really need to, in my experience, is particularly with um, with these sort of non-bank lenders, unless you have an insight to be able to pick through those loan portfolios, come up with what a genuine market value on resale would be, your own assessment now of the probability of default and the loss given default, um, have a look at what contingent liquidity they've got access to on their balance sheet to be able to bring in either to address liquidity or solvency issues. I think it's really difficult to speculate on the viability of those businesses going forward. Um, What I would say is that um, the probability of the economics for Bitcoin miners to dramatically improve in the next three, maybe even six months, um, I I don't think there's many participants who would be attaching a high probability to that outcome. So a really nice tailwind that sort of just says, oh, thank you, the market environment's improved, I've got less probability of default and my loss given default because of the correlated collateral has has improved. I'd like that to be the case, but it doesn't feel like it's a high probability from here. So I'm sorry I'm not being more crystal ballish there. Um, oh, it's always an unfair question to ask people about the future, but got to ask it because everyone's also curious about it, right? Let's move over to uh, interest rates, LTV, that sort of thing. This is always an interesting question. Of course, it changes. The last time we talked about it on this podcast was in July where we had the Galaxy Digital Minor Financing team on talking about what was happening in the wake of the Terra Luna crash in May, Bitcoin crash as well. We saw difficulty inching up more and you know, interest rates at the time were between like 12 and 20 percent we saw a few loans at the time i think bit farms closed some credit uh over the summer for around that 12 percent mark with nidig and since then we've had difficulty increase even more so we're at yet another all-time high as of yesterday uh and we're also seeing a lot of miners capitulate so in the public markets we've had documentation from argo core scientific iris uh, there's a bunch of private firms that have gone under And a lot of them were looking for debt financing, but I think in some instances it wasn't attractive to the lender and other instances it was too onerous on the borrower. Uh, But I'll throw it over to you. What does the the basic metrics of the lending market look like for minor financing? So I guess the first thing is, where do you want to play on the risk curve? And there's no right or wrong answer for that. Every financier will have a different position. Some will be looking to uh, lend to what I'll call truly distressed credits. There is an imminent uh, possibility of default. And therefore, they may wish to be, uh, in that context, still participating, and they're going to be structuring debt with equity. Uh, And that will come with some certain costs. Rarely will that be a debt-only finance that will typically have debt with equity instruments in there as well. Then on the other end of the continuum, there's uh, credits that are performing really well. 
So let me almost back up from your question and talk about industry thesis. So um, I guess every financier has to make a call on where they think the industry is going. And who, know, who knows what will be right or wrong? That's the judgment of it. Our view is, um, unfortunately, and there's so many wonderful people who have worked so hard in the industry, is that um, we're pretty bearish overall. So in a situation where hash price, and I'll steal that wonderful metric that I love, stays in that sub-$0.06 cent zone, we believe that um, ignoring even debt servicing availability, just paying for your energy, plus paying for your uh, general administrative expenses before you have debt servicing availability, a very significant portion of the operators are underwater. And therefore, any financing really is a, um, a, uh, a pass to help them avoid insolvency. And it is financing, almost like bridge financing, to, on the hope that the market environment improves or something about their financial performance can organically, dramatically improve. Um, so given we're a bit bearish on the sector overall, our thesis is that um, really more than any other sector I can think of, uh, cost differentiation is the name of the game. To recap on the basics, which we all know, and I've just got to keep reminding myself of this, if you're a Bitcoin miner, you can't differentiate your product. Mine doesn't look any better than yours. Well, and therefore, my customers will pay more for mine than they will pay for yours. So we've all generate the same product. Unlike normal um, mining industries, your geographic proximity to your customer makes no difference. So here, the name of the game is costs. The most efficient operators will find themselves with 70% 70, 70 of their cost base and north is energy. And we know that the economics of this industry mean that uh, who he who finds he or she who finds the cheapest energy and monetizes that through the cycle probably builds themselves the most resilient industry and they will keep as long as they can attract capex they'll keep deploying while their marginal costs of return on capital is positive to do so so in that context we really go hunting for people that we think have three things first and foremost a differentiated energy proposition um, now, in the current market, that means sort of if you're not south of $35 uh, dollars megawatt an hour, when we look through over the next 18 months, it's a really challenging position to be in. Now, there are many, many miners out there who are at 50, 60, 70. Um, in the current economics, we think that is a really, really difficult place to be to both cover your costs and certainly service any debt. So not only have you got to have selected your geography, which can be, frankly, luck or brilliance, um, to have selected the geography, the market, regulated, deregulated market, which country, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then even big places like the United States. So you might I've been in Texas last week. A pleasure to meet with so many people down there. Which part of Texas? It's a deregulated market. And there's fundamentally, we see the price, the local marginal price move dramatically in that. Do you go and get a power purchase agreement? Do you not? There's, uh, do you trade in the day ahead versus the, um, the uh, day market? Now, so there's a level of uh, sophistication required there around energy where given that that drives 75% of the cost base and you can't differentiate your revenue, your product, um, you need to be the best, best in the class. Now, by definition, that means it's going to be a thin slice of the industry that is setting that efficient cost curve. But that's the first thing we go hunting for. Next thing we go hunting for is engineering. If we know it's all about cost of production, then uh, that party, which for the same dollar of capex can generate more hashing power, for the same dollar of capex, they're going to have a real structural advantage. It's probably not as important as energy, but that means everything from your cooling technology to your orchestration software on both your form firmware for each device, but also controlling your fleet and how that integrates with your energy to the buildings you use um, and building it in a really cost-effective way. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more in the industry people talking about what that uh, edge looks like. And the last one is that financial now, how they think about their capital structure. I've been really impressed to talk to a couple of um, borrowers recently who are having some Bitcoin denominated debt on their balance sheet. I think that's a great idea in the capital mix. Um, it has much more right way risk characteristics around it. Frankly, you just can't have too much leverage full stop. So those three things are our lenses that we go looking at. Uh, energy, engineering, and financial lenses that we go looking at in a part of our thesis on the industry to say, well, which borrowers do we think is right for us on the risk curve? Which is not to say there won't be other financiers who won't want to play elsewhere in the risk curve, but that allows. Now, 
when we go and pick that out, that means we're dealing with a thin slice of the industry, frankly, that we think, to your early point, we're not looking to be the, um, the Hail Mary pass with the greatest respect to, to the borrowers. We're looking to help the best miners scale, not help miners survive. We're helping the best miners who are profitable today, delivering attractive cash flows today, and they're saying to themselves they've got an opportunity at their existing footprint the substation there, the electrical access is there, the, the land's there. And they're saying, I'll tell you what, if we could just put on one more building, put on another five or 10 megawatts, that could be really value recreative for them. And they've got a track record in doing so. That's the kind of miner we really want to partner with for us on the risk curve um, that will go out there. Now, at the moment, we've got one vanilla product. We're working on a couple of others we want to bring to market. Uh, and that's a secured lend with a, um, uh, a diverse security portfolio. And what that means for us is we lend a party some money that comes out of the pool. Uh, and when that capital gets deployed, we want to be able to have recourse to the cash generating entity. We've touched on that before. So not at the SPV stuff. Um, and we want to be able to take a first lien over physical security. And we want that to be a diverse portfolio. And typically we talk to borrowers. It's always a starting point in the discussion. About two thirds correlated one thirds cor un, um, two thirds correlated, one third uncorrelated. Now, if we combine that with a day one LTV of 65%, what we think that does mm -hmm. is uh, really provides a flaw on the loss given default if uh, your correlated assets fall dramatically in value and you might have some uncorrelated assets. Now, many borrowers, we find some borrowers that have got great operations, but they may not have the uncorrelated assets on their balance sheet to be able to offer a security. We've considered personal guarantees in some situations and we might have to not be able to do business there. So we've got to find where that match works. And then when we think about rate, that's definitely going to be a function of exactly where within the risk curve they are, within the subsection. But then how we also think about the, the LTV, how we think about the security package. And we've been positioning that in the sort of 15 to 20% range. Um, if you get higher than that, then that's probably talking to you going to a different class of borrower that, um, that probably isn't where we want to play on the risk curve. 15 to 20% for interest rates, gotcha. In terms of the offer, or not the offers, uh, the requests coming across your inbox, how many do you guys deny? Is it one out of every 10 makes it through for consideration? Is it one out of every 50? And then out of the that stack that you see, how many would you classify as like purely distressed loans that people are just reaching out, asking you, hey, we need some capital? Yeah, look, so unfortunately, we haven't written a loan yet. I was hoping that we would have. Um, we've spoken with more than 60 miners in a substantive way. Uh, and unfortunately, many great people there who work very, very hard um, and they're out there searching for capital, typically equity um, and or debt, we're finding it's it really is a minority of those that we think from our point of view, we want to play on the risk curve, um, are a fit. We've got a bunch of them in due diligence now. I'd expect to get some loans out the door before Christmas. The due diligence is pretty intensive when, when it works with us. You know, it's on site. It can take six, seven weeks. Um, we use third party to help us get comfortable with the valuations um, of the equipment, the background, background checks on the directors, all the kind of things that, frankly, you'd expect a, a, a commercial lend uh, when they've got their own capital at risk to do. We undertake those, and that takes some time. So unfortunately, the vast majority haven't made our underwriting standards thus far. Um, and we wish them well. And where that's not the case, I'm trying to do what we can with our network to point them at alternative financiers that might be able to help. Some of the original equipment manufacturers, I am I see them willing to take, frankly, a little bit more risk on the credit than, than uh, we would be willing to take. Uh, and that obviously may come with some um, uh, and a bit of a flip side there on the pricing of the units that they take down. Um, so we'll try and refer them where we can, but it's unfortunately, it's a real minority. We have a strong bias to uh, vertically integrate it, Miners, and uh, um, and particularly uh, miners that can combine some behind the meter energy strategies to really enhance their optionality about how they monetize that wonderful feature around Bitcoin mining in the sense that three seconds later you can shut that unit down, um, and where they can really monetize that behind the meter to figure out will they send the electricity that gets generated to the grid, or will they use it for Bitcoin mining? Or indeed, last week heard lots of really wonderful innovative strategies. Uh, about do I send it to EV charging? Do I send it somewhere else? Um, wonderful to hear about those. And the more you've got that optionality in your book, uh, I think that can really um, add a lot of value to the cash flow generation and diversification of that revenue.
Let's talk about ASIC back loans as we start winding up the discussion. ASIC back loans were more or less a cornerstone of minor financing for the last two years, right? That is painful for a lot of financiers who now are taking possession of those ASICs. And, you know, they might be just taking delivery of those boxes. They might have them on rack somewhere and have like a power contract already set up, but it's definitely a headache. And it's a headache for somebody who probably never really wanted to be in the mining business. They just wanted to get the, the cash flows from mining by being a financier. Uh, and then for the miners out there, it seems to be a good deal if you can default on it. But then, like you said, you take some reputation hit for doing so. Uh, and, and also, it's like, well, I have all these ASICs that were worth a lot. Now they're not worth a lot, but I have like this huge loan over my head. And that's sort of a problem. So we've seen many, many miners dealing with these issues. Going to boot the question over to you. Is this the death of ASIC back loans or is it going to stick around? Look, I don't think it's the death. But um, uh, lending against correlated assets without a claim on cash flow uh, and therefore housing the wrong way risk associated with that, as a any financier would need to get duly compensated for that risk. So at a certain rate, anything's possible. But the other thing to consider is a financier who has an alternative use for those ASICs they might be uh, find that they can actually house that wrong way risk in a much more effective way. So, for example, if um, if the icebreaker pool, which it does not, but if the icebreaker pool was also a hosting provider and was also an infrastructure operator, and most of our high hosting customers, and I'm making up a scenario here, were on a three-month or a six-month contract, um, a situation where we also had a lending business um, and we lent out defaults, received machines, hopefully in good working order, because that would have been part of our covenants. Well, we might be able to turn around and monetize those assets well, assuming we had the liquidity to do so in our own infrastructure. So in that scenario, I think a financier could quite rationally choose, as long as they were paid uh, appropriately for it, to do that format. So I think more broadly, the preponderance of that format, it's going to reduce dramatically and already has, but I wouldn't say it's dead. It's just a form, we've got to be much more conscious about the risks. Um, uh, I would expect that um, if you're a miner out there, they've got a lot of needs, a miner who's already profitable and wants to scale. Buying, uh, buying ASICs, now there's a, some fantastic deals going around in terms of the opportunities. If you've got the capital to deploy now, uh, I'm seeing things at $15, $16, $17 a terahash for good kit in good condition. Uh, so that can be a very attractive way to deploy capital. But also uh, energy contracts, uh, prepayment on power purchase agreements, having uh, a liquidity to support variation margin calls on power. There's a multitude of use, um, uses of funds there. And I can expect that any finance, any financier is going to come along and to be supportive to the borrower, they're going to have to take a blend, a diversified collateral pool. And that's probably the key thing there. I think we're going to see more diversified. Come on, let's talk about some assets which are less correlated and some assets which are more correlated. Now, unfortunately, what we are seeing across the market is the Bitcoin mining segment grew so intensely in the United States that, for example, at some size of transformers, good hard electrical infrastructure, the Bitcoin mining market has fundamentally distorted that market in the United States. So the secondary market for those units outside of Bitcoin mining is now really, um, you're, you're going to take a little bit of a bath on that. There are other size units within that transformer market where that won't be the case. But um, I guess all comes down to that the detail, the nuance, really understanding the market, the alternative uses uh, for the assets and thinking about managing risk. I love that you ended the that thought there because I do think a lot of people have questions about what is pristine collateral in a post ASIC back world. Like if these ASICs went down 80%, which is, you know, very people kind of knew that was going to happen because that's happened historically quite often. But now people are looking like, what is good collateral for Bitcoin miners? Is it infrastructure? Is it transformers? Is it power contracts? Is it ASICs? Is it Bitcoin? Is it other things like, what is good collateral for them? And you're saying it's a blend. So um, maybe we can expand on that a little bit. But It's a blend where, and unfortunately, it's one of those things, it's a good old line-by-line -line assessment. So when we talk about uh, physical electrical infrastructure, 
There's an enormous amount of infrastructure from switchgear, transformers, all the way down. Um, and uh, the, you've really got to understand every little step of that. And, and then even down to the land. And I've had some situations where I've discussed with borrowers and they say, hey, I've acquired this land. That's uncorrelated. My response to them sometimes might be, yes, it can be. But in other cases, unfortunately, the only credible alternative use for that land sitting next to that substation in that location is a Bitcoin mine. Because there isn't there isn't enough um, uh, 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 cabling to support data for other data center applications to use that for an alternative purpose. So it is line by line. And I, what I find is having that discussion with borrowers, uh, prospective borrowers, they're really up for it because typically they want to understand the risks in this themselves. And going through that on a line by line assessment to talk about what might the recovery be um, and being really transparent with them. Hey, guys, this is how I make money. This is how our lenders are looking for. Um, and they're business leaders. They get that. So having that conversation with them in a really open, candid way, it usually gets to uh, a very sensible, shared understanding. Okay, this this won't work. Or maybe this might work. Um, but it, it's very granular. You can't just talk about transformers. Well, what size? Um, has it been maintained to the NERC standards? Not all the miners have been fully adhering to those NERC standards. That gives you a nice maintenance schedule have you been adhering to that not necessarily a right or a wrong but if you haven't been it's going to be really hard to sell that to other industrial applications so get granular on it assess it make it a nice two-way discussion and hopefully um our, our approach is if if we are not in a position to be able to do a lend we'd hope that the borrower comes out with much more um insight into how other financiers might approach them they're feeling more equipped that how they might take their proposition to market uh, in the wake of FTX and the collapse there with a lack of due diligence, this is actually very refreshing to hear. So I, I love to hear the line by line thought on uh, itemization here. Glenn, thank you so much for joining the Mining Pod. Where can our audience find any of your work or your Twitter or anything else you do? So Glenn Jones DeFi on Twitter, um, icebreakerfinance.biz. Um, it's got a little contact email. That's one of those sort of generic ones, but really comes to my inbox and one of my team uh, colleague members. So uh, reach out to us. We're always really keen to speak to miners. And um, even if we're not in a position to be able to, to do lens, we hope to be able to help them in other ways, even if we can't you know, financially benefit from doing so and just help them leverage our network to, so they can be successful. Perfect. Thank you again. Appreciate your time. Pleasure, Will. Thank you.